Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Oops. And let's get rid of that. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. The, uh, uh, I need to apologize for Nick Anderson. Nick Anderson is the, uh, the staff lead for uh, powerlifting, uh, and he uh, uh, got ill earlier today, and uh, although I'm sure he'll be fine, uh, is unable to join us for the session this evening. So I'll be filling in with him, or for him, uh, hopefully can answer most of your questions. Uh, many of you know me. Again, my name is Mike Sarnowski. I'm the Senior Director uh, for Community Sports and oversee Special Olympics Maryland's overall sports program uh, for, uh, um, for the state. Uh, and we'll do my best to answer questions. Uh, we do expect uh, about 10 folks on the call tonight, so if you could please mute your phone. Uh, and then just when you have, you can do that again, uh, either using the mute function on your phone or by pressing star six, as it says on the screen, uh, and that will uh, help with the background noise. Uh, but again, we certainly do want your input and your, your questions, and you can just unmute your phone and ask your question at that time. Uh, I should also tell you that this session is being recorded uh, so that we can post uh, a link if everything goes right with the recording. Uh, we can post a link uh, to the recording for those folks who are unable to join us this evening. So that said, oops, went a little too far there. Uh, just uh, the agenda, we want to uh, do uh, some introductions of our sports management team. Uh, I don't know that we need to necessarily do it for the folks that are on the call. Um, but uh, then also some just, uh, we want to briefly go through the, um, uh, some of the paperwork and some of the forms. Uh, we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that since most of you should be familiar with that and, and the content will be in the slide deck. Uh, then we want to discuss uh, head coach certification, um, some rules updates and reminders, uh, mostly reminders. I don't know that the rules have changed at all. Uh, go over qualifying for the state competition, uh, uh, some deadlines and dates and then resources and uh, additional Q&A at that point. Um, uh, that said, uh, we've started at Special Olympics headquarters uh, uh, creating several different sport management teams uh, uh, for, uh, we've got six launched right now. Um, uh, in addition to powerlifting, uh, we've also started one for tennis, for soccer, for um, basketball, flag football, and uh, golf. Um, I think that's all of them uh, that we have going right now. Uh, and the, the purpose of these teams is to help guide the sport uh, and provide and, and locate, identify resources uh, and such, but also to help uh, manage the sport throughout the season. Uh, those sports, uh, those teams that are coming online for some of the fall sports now, of course, are a little bit behind the gun uh, and uh, we'll be picking up as we go through. Uh, we'll be adding additional sports management teams as we go through the year. Um, and eventually then they'll all be in place and can be looking at each of the sports throughout the entire year. Uh, one of the things we're trying to get for all the sports management teams is a uh, diversity in terms of geography, in terms of uh, role, uh, et cetera, uh, for the sport. So we tried to get folks from a couple different counties involved. Uh, for powerlifting, we are looking for a few more folks uh, to join us right now. Uh, we have on the team, it's a... Uh, uh, it's only four, folk, four people at the moment. Uh, Len Walker, uh, who is still with us and is uh, living right now in Laurel. He has not made the move to uh, uh, down south just yet. Um, uh, and he would still stay with us uh, working remotely. Uh, but Len, uh, Jim Downs from Montgomery County, Scott Shiplett from Anne Arundel County, uh, and Nick Anderson uh, as the staff lead. But if anyone here is interested, uh, we'd be looking for people with a good deal of experience um, uh, in, uh, with the sport. Uh, we are definitely looking for an athlete to serve on this uh, team. So if you have an athlete you think you may be appropriate, uh, we'd be looking, the athlete um, should be able to make calls and be comfortable working in a, um, a conference call uh, type of format. Um, and not every athlete, uh, not any, everybody, every person is comfortable doing that. Uh, but most of the meetings will be done in this type of a format uh, and also should be someone who feels comfortable speaking up and expressing their opinion. Um, so uh, if you know of anyone, uh, you could send them in to Nick Anderson. Uh, his email will be at the end of the slides. Uh, we'll also be sending these slides out to folks uh, following the session. Probably will go out tomorrow morning. So that said, uh, we'll dive in 
to hear. Hopefully, this is no surprise to anybody here on the call, uh, but uh, for the paperwork for medical forms and for uh, applications, bottom line is that no athlete, no volunteer can participate in any manner uh, in a Special Olympics program without a valid medical or a valid up-to-date volunteer application and screening. Um, and there are no exceptions to this policy. Uh, that has always been the policy. Uh, I um, would not be surprised if uh, not every area has adhered to it, but I am telling you that's absolutely required uh, that this be adhered to. There is no grace period of an athlete showing up and then is, uh, has a week or so to get their paperwork in. Uh, they need to have a valid medical at that time. Same thing goes, your, your volunteers similarly have to have their applications in. Um, again, no exceptions. Uh, when stuff is due, uh, the training registration deadline, uh, and this is for all of the fall sports uh, or sports that are contested at the fall uh, sports festival, uh, the training registration deadline is the uh, 3rd of September. Uh, that's when your, uh, your area has to have your roster of athletes, unified partners, coaches, or other volunteers that are participating in your program registered in GMS. GMS is our software program uh, that we use to handle that. Um, and that establishes who's eligible to, to compete at the state competition, assuming, of course, that they meet all the other criteria, all the other requirements. Um, again, that is the date when that has to be in. Since most of you are not able to enter the stuff directly into the software, uh, you're going to be working with an area, someone in your area who is your GMS manager. In some cases, it's the area director. In some cases, it's someone else. You'll need to work with them to get that information to them in a timely manner so they can get the information into the system at that point. And again, if we could, uh, if you could please put your phone. I hear someone, uh, sounds like a dog in the background there. Please mute your phone. Hello. Yes, hi. Whoever said hello, if you could please mute your phone. Uh, you can use star six to mute it. Um, that would help. It'll help with the background noise. Okay. Uh, what should I do? Leave, leave my phone? No, plus, if you could press star six, please, that will mute your phone. I, I, I tell you what, well, I'm at the um, M&T Bank Stadium right now, and I was just dialing in. I thought I'd just listen in. But I can't, apparently I can't do that. Uh, if you press star so, six, that will mute your phone, and you can listen in then. Okay. Just, what, uh, how do I do that? Uh, on your phone, press star and six. Press, uh, uh, press six? Press star. And six? And then six. Okay, I will. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that, that seems to work. That seems to have worked. Thank you. Um, uh, again, the, um, uh, work with your area to find out when your, the person who handles your computer entry needs to get this stuff. Typically, it's going to be a week ahead of time, but it's going to vary by person. And if you don't know who your GMS person is for your area, uh, contact your area director when we hang up tonight and find out, because you should know who that person is well ahead of time to make these arrangements. Um, anybody, you, uh, you certainly do want to include everybody who's participating, even if they join after that date, uh, and they should be entered into the system. Uh, just after that date, they wouldn't be eligible to compete at the state competition. Uh, then, again, uh, as we said before, no one can start the program without a medical, uh, a valid and up-to-date medical or a valid and up-to-date uh, volunteer application. Um, we also know that sometimes those uh, updates are handed to you at the beginning of the season or at various points, and it takes a little bit of time to get them in. So uh, the date of uh, September 14th is the deadline to get for your area leadership to get that information, uh, those forms, into headquarters. And again, the athlete medical that uh, has to be valid through October 24th, which is the uh, state championship similarly. The volunteer or coach application uh, must be valid through the 24th as well. And then two other notes for coaches uh, and for volunteers uh, in this case. Um, uh, everyone, when you became a volunteer, you first started volunteering for Special Olympics, uh, you completed a protective behavior certification. Uh, it was a brief, I think maybe 10 or 15 minute online um, uh, thing that you went through and then a short quiz at the end. 
uh, those actually expire uh, and need to be renewed every three years. It's a risk management component and it's required by Special Olympics uh, North America and Special Olympics International. Um, we have not been uh, keeping tabs on that really well uh, and we are starting to now, so we'll send reminders, but uh, by that date, by the 14th also, uh, if you do not have an up-to-date um, uh, protected behaviors, that would need to be uh, updated by then as well. Uh, and then lastly, we'll talk a little bit more about coach certification, uh, but throughout this, the course of this entire year, we've been um, uh, enforcing the rule uh, that all head coaches have to have Special Olympics coach certification for their specific sport, uh, and that's the date by which that would need to be met, the, 9th, the 14th of September. And then lastly, uh, in terms of deadlines, the competition registration deadline is October 1st. That's the date by which uh, you need to indicate uh, what events each person is in, uh, what their, um, uh, I guess, what their best lifts are in your case. Uh, for other events, it's their entry scores, entry times, so on down the line. Uh, in addition, uh, anybody who will not be attending uh, the Fall Sports Festival should be deleted in GMS and such. And just as, again, with the other deadlines, uh, since you need to get that work done through someone else who has that access, um, work with that person now. Uh, and get uh, that uh, taken care of to, in terms of the dates that you would have for that. Uh, there's then, uh, so again, this is just reminding you to talk to the respective uh, folks within your area to get your deadlines and get your, uh, uh, find out exactly who you need to submit stuff through and when they need it to get it all taken care of. Uh, I'm not going to read through all these. Um, if you've been a coach before and you've uh, come through these sessions, we've gone through all these slides. I won't be, we're including them in here so you have them for reference because, again, we will be sending these slides out. Um, but just in a nutshell, uh, again, this describes what's uh, on the athlete medical, what needs to be done, uh, and then as a reminder, the medical that uh, in order to be the person to be eligible for the competition, their medical needs to be valid through the 24th of October, which is the date of the Fall Sports Festival. Um, but they can't start at all without a medical that's up to date uh, and that's valid. Uh, that's the medical form. Uh, and then similarly, as we said before, for volunteers or coaches, coaches, partners, volunteers, anybody who's in that capacity, uh, they would have to have an up to date uh, volunteer application that's valid through October 24th as well. Um, uh, and it points out there, uh, if you have a volunteer who is a minor uh, that, uh, who is under the age of 18, there is an addition a volunteer minor reference form that requires signed uh, references. Uh, the other, uh, the general volunteer form just requires the name of a reference and their contact information. Uh, for those who are minors, it needs to be a signed reference uh, or two signed references. Uh, and uh, so that can take a little bit of extra time, so be sure that they have that time for that. And all these forms you can download from MySOMD uh, as well. Uh, all, and uh, just as a reminder, for application for uh, medicals and for volunteer applications, they're valid for three years. The exception is for those who are those volunteers who are minors, their application will expire on their 18th birthday. So that could be less than three years. It could be longer than three years as well, uh, but that'll expire on their 18th birthday, and then they'll need to get a new one. If you have someone who turned this happened with summer games with two folks, if you have someone who's going to be turning 18 during the season. Um, work with your regional sports director uh, and we can work out um, getting the forms in uh, in a proper manner for that person since they really can't sign the new volunteer application uh, when they're not an adult. So uh, there's the volunteer application uh, and the volunteer reference and again these are available for download. Um, incident accident report, um, uh, this is in case uh, typically it's in case of anybody getting injured at your program it also can be used for any kind of property damage, um, please do be familiar with it. I recommend you include or keep copies of this in your first aid kit. Uh, so they're always available along with a pen or a pencil. Uh, fill it out as soon as is possible. Of course, treat the injury or treat the injured party first. Um, that's, of course, the highest priority. But get this information as quickly as possible and then send it in, uh, as it indicates at the bottom, uh, to our, our headquarters. Uh, also send a copy of this to your area director so he or she is aware of uh, the incident that occurred. Uh, and then if you wish to host a qualifier uh, or a competition of some type, uh, this is the sanction form for that. Um, uh, it's relatively self-explanatory. 
Uh, again, copies of this are available there. This is so that we know at headquarters uh, what's going on uh, and when competitions are. Even if you're doing an in-house qualifier, this counts, uh, or we would need to, or would want to get this. Uh, it needs to be submitted by your area director, um, and it can be submitted electronically by them if you can't get it to their in their hands to get an actual written uh, signature uh, on that. And again, it sounds like we still have someone with their, their phone unmuted. If you could just please uh, mute your phone, that would be helpful. Um, so entries, um, we talked through the different deadlines. Um, but to be eligible to compete at the state competition, uh, athletes or partners have to compete. Uh, and in your case, there's really no partners. But athletes need to compete in at least two sanctioned qualifiers. One needs to be a multi-program qualifier. And multi-program does not mean every program in the state. Multi-program means more than one program. Um, and while we certainly do encourage for those who can host them, <coughs> excuse me, to have uh, qualifiers or competitions that have many uh, areas there, you can still meet this by having just one other program join you for a uh, sanctioned competition. Um, in addition, another qualifier could be an in-house qualifier. Uh, we really do encourage you to have as many different competition opportunities for your athletes as possible. Um, but we also know, particularly with powerlifting, access to equipment, access to facilities that can handle uh, larger uh, competitions are somewhat limited. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, it, but the bottom line is just more competition. And competition uh, can be as simple as you hosting another program coming over, and uh, so you're only talking about 20 or so. Uh, athletes, but that still has a competition experience that's for, the, uh, for your athletes to, um, to uh, enjoy and to, to help them better their lifts uh, and such. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, qualifiers have to use proper equipment. Uh, that includes uh, judging. That doesn't mean you have to have top of the line judging equipment, uh, but appropriate judging uh, signa or, um, uh, signaling devices of some type, manual or electronic, whatever the case may be. Um, that you have your officials in place uh, and are following your following the rules, the Special Olympics rules and the National Governing Body rules as well, uh, and that your results are recorded and then forwarded on to uh, Special Olympics headquarters after the competition is over. And that would apply to whether it's an in-house qualifier or a multi-program uh, qualifier, uh, as is indicated there. Uh, also, at each qualifier, uh, athletes need to compete in the events in which they will compete at the Fall Sports Festival. So if they're doing the, <coughs> if, if an athlete uh, wishes to enter the deadlift uh, and the, uh, the bench press and the combination, they would need to do both the deadlift and the, uh, the bench press at the qualifiers, the two qualifiers that they would go to. Uh, if they can't do them at both, then they would need to attend a third qualifier to get that additional one. And hopefully you're having as many competition opportunities as possible and they are uh, going to uh, more than just two. Um, also with this, if there is a non-Special Olympics um, powerlifting event that offers these, ev these competitions, it offers a deadlift, offers a bench press that your athletes can go to, those also count as competitions as well. Um, let's see. Uh, and then also we'll, uh, about two weeks prior to the competition, so that's the qualifiers that you have there in terms of the eligibility and we talked through all those. Uh, then coaches uh, will ask uh, for a powerlifting registration form. That's in addition to the competition registration, but it, it can't be entered. It's not something that, was en that gets entered into GMS. It's a separate form that Blen and his team then uses uh, to do the weight uh, and to do the divisioning and such. Uh, and it'll include things like body weight, weight class lifts, and so on down the line. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so be prepared for that. Uh, again, that'll be required about two weeks prior to the competition. There still will be weigh-ins. Uh, at the competition itself, uh, but um, uh, this gives at least some sense of what we've got to work with at that point. Uh, we mentioned or alluded to earlier head coach certification. Um, this actually has been a policy or a requirement uh, that Special Olympics North America and Special Olympics um, Incorporated has had for at least 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, and for various reasons, Special Olympics Maryland has not enforced it uh, or uh, consistently adhered to it for the last several years. Uh, we are, it actually applies, the official rule applies to all sports coaches. Uh, we have been over the course of this year, starting with basketball, 
have been requiring it for all head coaches. Um, and uh, we'll talk through the specifics of it. Uh, you should have received a couple different communications throughout the year uh, on this. And um, so there shouldn't be any surprise, but I also recognize that some folks uh, don't pay attention to it until their season comes up, and so you may not have, it may not have been top of mind. <coughs> Excuse me. But bottom line is that all head coaches um, need to have that sports certification uh, requirement met uh, at, by September 14th. Uh, I should also say that uh, the September 14th date, uh, as well as almost any of the deadlines, not necessarily all, but many of the deadlines, if there is a truly extenuating circumstance, uh, have your area director talk to your regional sports director, and there may be a chance that we could give an extra day or two or something like that uh, to get something accomplished or to get something in. Uh, that would not, of course, apply to an athlete who doesn't have a medical or a, uh, a coach who doesn't have uh, a current um, application or volunteer who doesn't have a current application, um, unless there's one that's expiring later on in the season. Because, uh, again, no one can without that stuff in hand. So uh, who is a head coach and who does this apply to? Uh, this is relatively generic there. Uh, but if it's a team sport, it's a named coach for the team. Uh, in other cases here, uh, it's really one head coach per delegation uh, for powerlifting. Uh, and if there is, if you use what's called what we call the sports coordinator model, uh, where someone other than the coach uh, is handling a lot of the sports-related uh, issues and, um, and things related to your competition, I know that Howard County uses a model like that, Baltimore County does, and there may be a few others as well. Uh, then that sport coordinator would also need uh, to be uh, to have their their powerlifting certification. As well, it's valid for up to three years, and an update will be sent out this week with um, the status of, of everybody in terms of their trainings uh, that we have on record, at least, uh, as well as uh, learning opportunities. Uh, we'll talk in a moment about some in-person uh, opportunities as well. Uh, if you uh, have been certified in powerlifting uh, previously, and for this go round or for this uh, period, we're accepting it certified uh, by Special Olympics as far back as there's any kind of record. Uh, so, if you have previously been certified, all you need to do is renew that certification. And to do that, uh, you need to complete either one general or one powerlifting specific, sport specific, but it's relevant to that sport. So, or one powerlifting specific learning opportunity in order to renew. Uh, and that renews your powerlifting certification for three years. Uh, if you have never been certified in powerlifting, even if you've been certified in basketball or soccer or whatever, but never in powerlifting, uh, it's a two uh, components that need to be completed. One, you need to have taken Coaching Special Olympics Athletes, which is a uh, three-hour course that's offered as a classroom session as well as offered online, or Principles of Coaching, which is a longer full-day session, <coughs> excuse me, which some of you have taken uh, as well. So you need to complete one or the, one or the other of those. It's, it's basically a general um, session or a, a, uh, a, a non-sport uh, specific session on coaching Special Olympics athletes or athletes with intellectual disabilities. Then, in addition, you need to complete a sports-specific session. And we'll talk about some options with that in a minute. Uh, so, again, if you have a previous certification, all you need to do is renew it, and you can either take a general course or a powerlifting-specific course. If you've never had a certification in powerlifting, it's two steps. It's coaching. Typically, folks are going to take coaching Special Olympics athletes uh, and then a powerlifting-specific learning experience as well. At, in the future, very likely starting in 2016, this is going to apply to all coaches, not just head coaches. The actual rule, the actual requirement, does apply to all coaches. Uh, we're just enforcing it initially with head coaches, and we've been doing it uh, starting with basketball this season. And again, it's not something new. It's been on the books for at least 20 or 25 years, um, probably longer. Um, actually, it's at least been since 1990. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I know that for sure. So, um, but anyhow, so we currently have, and this is not specifically powerlifting, but we currently have several coaching sessions coming up. Uh, these are being hosted by Special Olympics Maryland. Uh, specifically for powerlifting, 
There is a live session that will be held on the 9th of August at Special Olympics headquarters uh, from 1 to 4 in the Baltimore area. Uh, registration link is there. It was, that was announced or listed on the sports calendar also that was sent out last week. <clears throat> we may, if uh, there is sufficient interest and enough people to make it worthwhile, we may also offer what we call a master coaches webinar. You see that uh, there's one listed there for soccer and for kayaking. Uh, that is for uh, coaches with at least five years of experience, and it's really an opportunity for um, whether you're getting certified or not. It, it, the, the ones we've held before have been great opportunities for coaches um, uh, just interested in the sport. And the notion around that is taking a bunch of very experienced people uh, and getting some questions or some challenges that they're facing and have a conversation, a, a facilitated conversation amongst the coaches where they learn from each other. Uh, so if you're having a particular problem with an athlete who has a particular lift quirk or whatever, you can hear from other coaches how maybe they've dealt with it or kind of do a little brainstorming of things that might happen or might work with that. Uh, we don't currently have one for powerlifting just because of the numbers, but if there is sufficient interest, uh, we certainly could offer one. Uh, again, that requires uh, for folks to participate uh, it's not open registration for that. It's at least five years of experience, and also the area director, uh, your area director, has to recommend you for that as well. As is noted there, our intention is to record the live sessions, uh, and uh, we'll see if we can't convert uh, some portions of those uh, live and in-person sessions uh, to web content so that someone who can't come there personally uh, can participate in it uh, in that way as well. Uh, we're also looking to host uh, additional coaching Special Olympics athlete sessions. Um, we have 20-some uh, instructors for that uh, and can increase the number of instructors if need be um, and can, we'll take that on the road. Most of those have been out in the area or out in the field uh, and just need a minimum uh, classroom, a minimum of five to seven folks and just uh, classroom space in order to hold this. Uh, if you are interested in holding some, something like this, talk to your area director, uh, and he or she can then work with your regional sports director uh, and the staff sports lead, in this case that would be Nick, for powerlifting, uh, to work on clinicians and some other opportunities there. Uh, in addition, although this, this doesn't apply from a sports-specific uh, component, but for the general uh, components down here for powerlifting, um, we do uh, observe or accept online courses. ASEP, which is the American Sports Education Program, uh, offers a variety of online courses. Uh, there's a cost associated with them, but Special Olympics Maryland will subsidize uh, that fee, and in many cases your area uh, leadership will subsidize the remainder of the fee, so there's no cost to the coach. Um, but if you just need to renew your certification, the um, uh, any of these general sessions here would be appropriate. Uh, there is a strength and conditioning principles course uh, here as well, uh, but it is not related to competitive powerlifting, and so that's why it's not appropriate as a sports-specific session. Uh, but uh, in the, the information that will go out later this week with the, uh, the status of folks, uh, how you can sign up for these is also going to be included. In addition, uh, just what are some other opportunities that you can take care of or that can satisfy that requirement? And again, this is once every three years. One would hope you would do it more often than that, <coughs> but you only need to renew your, your certification once every three years uh, for this sport. Um, again, we mentioned live sessions. Uh, we could be, we're looking at, again, converting some of that content to an online option. I mentioned about ASEP. Uh, also, the uh, NFHS, National Federation of State High School Associations, uh, I don't know if they have anything for powerlifting per se, uh, but um, their online courses or live courses are fine as well. Um, uh, some national governing body courses, and I know that Jim Downs has looked into some options there, uh, and we'll provide some additional information in terms of uh, uh, some options uh, that, uh, that could satisfy that through the, uh, the national governing bodies. Um, if you go through officials training from the national governing body or Special Olympics, um, again, live or online, uh, that covers that. Again, it would be powerlifting officials. I mentioned about the master coaches. If you serve as an instructor for any of these courses, uh, we don't currently offer the structured mentoring experience, uh, but that is something that we will be adding to the mix at the beginning of uh, 2016 
Uh, we just need to uh, get it kind of um, uh, worked out in terms of the specifics. Um, and then if you have another suggestion, uh, we are certainly open to that. Uh, we'll have the sports management team review any suggestions that come in uh, for alternative uh, learning. And uh, uh, you know, our, our tendency is more towards saying yes than saying no as far as this goes. It would just need to be sure that it has some meat to it and that uh, participation can be tracked. So that's uh, some additional opportunities there. Uh, in terms of the general um, opportunities, uh, coaching in general, which again you could use to renew a certification. Uh, this would not um, substitute for the um, uh, the requirement if you're if you've never been certified in powerlifting. Uh, but again, there's the Coaching Special Olympics. Uh, there's an online unified course uh, through NFHS, I believe, uh, and that's actually free. Uh, first aid course, uh, any uh, courses that we host related to coaching athletes with disabilities. Uh, there could be if you're an, a teacher or you do some kind of in-service learning through your um, through your employer that's related to working with individuals with disabilities or intellectual disabilities um, that's targeted at the uh, the content there um, that could be approved. We've had that uh, for one only one teacher has applied uh, for an in-service and hers was approved. Uh, so we, we're batting a hundred <laughs> or a thousand on that rather. Um, and then again, serving as an instructor and such. So that's coaching um, requirements, uh, and we'll um, we'll go from there. Uh, a quick question, uh, Len, are you on the call? Okay. Uh, and Len, uh, well, if you're Len, if you're on the call, make sure you've um, unmuted your phone. <laughs> nope. Okay. Uh, the powerlifting events, uh, deadlift, bench press, and combination. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I unfortunately, uh, Nick Anderson um, uh, was taken ill earlier today and was not able to handle the call tonight, so I'm, st I'm uh, uh, stepping in for him. Um, I can cover some of this information, but I am by no means a powerlifting expert, uh, and any additional information that needs to be uh, covered, we can send out uh, additionally with there. Uh, and I would also encourage Jim and Scott uh, if you're on the call, if there's anything that I'm missing, to please do jump in. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, I don't want to read all these to you, but um, 16 years of age is the minimum. Uh, that's a health-related component uh, uh, because based on growth plates, yes, we know different people age at different rates, but um, that is a requirement from a, a health and safety standpoint. Uh, talks there about uh, the powders you can use, chalk, et cetera. Um, and it comes to the lifting area, just one, the athlete, uh, him or herself, and one coach uh, up there, uh, along with the officials and the folks that are running the venue, of course. Um, you have a minute uh, to initiate your lift. Um, uh, and then again, if you do need, uh, and if you have an athlete who needs additional time, um, again, we, we want to be inclusive rather than exclusive here, but we do have rules, and part of, part of the impact and the benefit of sports is learning to follow the rules and, uh, the con and to deal with the consequences that come with that. But if you do have someone that needs additional time, ask ahead of time. We can flag it in GMS. Actually, your GMS manager can flag it in GMS, put it in the comments field, um, and then we'll know ahead of time uh, and can, in most cases, accommodate that. Uh, but again, it really needs to be for someone who needs that, not just someone because you want to give them the extra time. Uh, and then if um, any lifts that are, are weights that are dropped intentionally will be declared a no lift uh, and possibly uh, disqualifying the athlete completely from that event. Um, mention about the uniform requirements. Uh, I'm not going to read through all these. You can read through them at, their, you know, at your leisure. Um, just note down at the bottom that oil, grease, or other lubricants are forbidden. Um, as far as that, uh, lifting belt is optional. Uh, what else? Um, uh, uh, Jim or Scott, I don't want to put you on the spot, um, but um, be, be, but again, I openly acknowledge I'm not a, an expert on powerlifting, uh, but we wanted to go ahead with the session tonight just so that people don't have to reschedule it. Uh, do you have any quick pointers or quick reminders um, that you can toss in for the bench press? And then we'll do the same for the, um, uh, for the uh, deadlift as well. Sure. This is, this is Jim. The uh, key points for bench press is the head shoulders, uh, butt, and feet must uh, remain in contact, feet with the floor, and head, shoulders, and, and butt with the bench, 
have to have a wait for your three commands, start, um, press, and rack. If they, if they do any of those things before they get the command, it's a bad lift. Um, person lifting off should lift off and then step out of the way so the judges can see the lift properly. Um, that's all I can think of for bench press. Okay. Well, the, the, uh, this is Linda Belcito. Hey, Bell Jay. If the uh, lifters require a um, a block under their feet, there are designated heights of blocks that can be used so that the lifters can set themselves on the bench without having a disadvantage of wobbling back and forth. Um, any uneven extension is a legal bench press as long as the weight doesn't stop and go back down during the lift. And if, you know, I think the main thing with the bench press is that we just have to be mindful that the safety is the issue. Mm -hmm. If a lifter is really struggling, um, once that bar comes to a, you know, a stop in their effort and they're really not making progress, it's really the head referee's call to have the spotters take that bar and put it back in the rack. Uh, a question again. I, I, uh, I toss this out to, to the group, and um, uh, it, it, we mentioned before about an athlete who potentially needs uh, an adaptation uh, for their time uh, to initiate the lift. Are there any adaptations in terms of form uh, other than the uh, the blocks for the the foot um, uh, that folks should be aware of for the bench press? If, if a lifter, so sometimes depending on the certain disabilities with their joints, if they can't fully extend their arms, in other words, to lock out their elbows, um, it's a judgment call, but they need to, as you said, they need to note that in GMS, and they need to note that uh, on the platform before the lift so the judges know what to look for. We have an athlete whose wrists turn in a little bit, so it's very hard for her to do a full extension. Her full extension is a slightly curved arm, so that's okay as long as it's noted ahead of time as part of her disability. I know other counties have uh, one lifter who's uh, dis disabled from the waist down, and they'll use a weight uh, bench, uh, I'm sorry, a weight belt to um, secure the athlete to the bench. And again, as long as the uh, head referee knows that that's going to happen, that's going to take probably more than a minute. Um, trying to think of any other uh, any other uh, combinations we've had to make over the last few years. Yeah, I think the two that come to mind. Yeah, and I think most of the coaches understand that, you know, to, to be time efficient, every athlete, once they're called and the bar is loaded, they have a minute to make the attempt. But as Jim said, in some of these situations, we have to be mindful that some of these athletes have to be, you know, physically helped to set up on the bench to keep them safe so that they can make a successful attempt in the effort. Um, and then uh, while we're on the bench press, is there anything um, uh, we mentioned about a coach being able to be up on the, uh, the platform with the athlete uh, in terms of what that individual can and cannot do uh, specific to the bench press? Well, we have, uh, and I know there are other athletes that are uh, hearing impaired or d completely deaf. So uh, Jim and I use hand signals. And if that athlete can, you know, get used to the commands by seeing our hand signals, as long as they are in sync with the head judge, then the head judge can, you know, referee that athlete fairly. Mm -hmm. So we use the hand signals for an athlete who can't hear, start, press, racket. And that's the way we train them so that they, you know, can see the hand signals and still the head coach has to move aside so that the head referee can see that the bar is coming down and becoming motionless on the chest before the press signal so that it's fair for the lifter and also for the other athletes. And I would note for some of the coaches that sometimes the um, autistic, depending if you have athletes that have autism, they sometimes respond better with the hand signals than they do uh, with the with the voice command, so think about that. If you, if you find in practice that your autistic lifters respond better to a hand signal, um, I would consider using hand signal as part of the accommodation. 
Right, and again, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, I think two things to take from this is one, again, we, we really do want to be more inclusive than exclusive, but at the same time, even when we're being inclusive, there are rules that are being followed with that. And then secondly, communication, communicating through GMS and communicating with the head judge at that location uh, are key um, to making it successful. I think that there's a really solid community with, among uh, powerlifting coaches and powerlifters in general uh, to really uh, go for success. I should also point out, I'm sorry, one of the things that the sports management team uh, is doing uh, is submitting a rule change uh, related to the, uh, the weight of uh, or allowing a lighter weight bar um, for use by some athletes. Special Olympics Maryland will continue to follow that, uh, that adaptation that we've instituted for some time. Um, and uh, this opportunity that's coming up um, with this next go-round is the first opportunity to submit a rules change um, related to that, so we will be doing that. But that's another adaptation that, uh, based on the weight of the bar, there's a lighter weight bar that can be used as well. Uh, with the deadlift, uh, again, Jim, sorry, Jim and, and Scott, sorry to put you, and LJ, uh, uh, since you're, I didn't realize you were on the call, um, uh, any quick pointers for uh, newer coaches uh, or just reminders in general for experienced coaches related to the deadlift? Um, uh, Jim, do you want to speak? Oh, go ahead, LJ, you got it. Okay. Um, with the deadlift, what you want to make sure is that your athletes uh, starting the deadlift, they want to be as far as possible. Um, when you're training them, you want to make sure that they're not rounding their back and when they come to the full stand position, they have to sort of lock their shoulders back. Your shoulders have to be in an upright, not completely locked back, but in a uh, completely standing position knees have to be locked. Um, there cannot be any hitching, leaning on the upper leg, any downward motion during the attempt. And again, if they get to a point where the weight is just not going to move any further, it's up to the head judge or the coach to give the down signal. In a competition, it's the head judge that says down, and that's by keeping your hand up when the lifter starts to take that attempt. And in training, I would go through this with them as well so they become familiar with what they're going to see. When they get to the top of their lip, that hand comes down and you scream down because those are the commands they're going to get in the deadlift. They have to follow the bar down to the platform. They don't have to do a, rever a reverse deadlift or a negative deadlift, but they, they can't just drop it or throw it to the platform. Those are all things that they might get a warning for, and if they continue to do those things, they will or have the potential to be disqualified in the event. Um, their grip can, you know, some athletes like to do two overhand grips. You really have to work with your athletes to see what's more comfortable for them. Um, most of our athletes use the over-under grip, and again, you have to figure out which hand is going to be their dominant side for the under grip and the over grip, and that has to be set evenly in the center of the bar. Um, there are two different types of stances in the deadlift. There's a conventional deadlift, which is the close stance, legs are sort of shoulder distance apart, where the athlete will set up sort of go down into a sitting position, grab the bar just outside of their legs with the proper grip, and then basically push their feet through the floor and stand up. Other lifters, some lifters use sumo, which is a little bit more difficult to train and teach, but some of our larger athletes uh, tend to do better because it is a less demanding pull uh, as far as distance but it does take a little more time to teach as far as the technique. Uh, again, they can use belts, they can use chalk on their hands. Sometimes we will use baby powder on the top of their thighs, not too much, just a little bit to help them because once the bar comes up the shin and then reaches the knee position, that's where it gets a little more heavy and the powder sometimes helps to make the weight move a little faster for them. Um, 
I think that's all I have. Jim? Yeah, just the, as it's coming up the legs, it can touch the legs, but it can't rest on the legs. So if they, right. if they go halfway up and they sort of rest it on their knees, that's a bad lift. So, uh, right. and so, yeah, other than, and the, the bar can stop. It can't go back down. Any, any movement back down and the lift is over. But other than that, it's a pretty basic lift. Just wait, uh, pick it up and then wait for the down command. So. Right. It's just the easiest one to teach. It's not always the easiest one to get right, though. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, then uh, combination is pretty straightforward. It's a uh, it's a mathematical combination of the two uh, best lifts um, uh, for the deadlift, or the the best lift for the deadlift and the best lift for the bench press are the two scores combined there. Um, Mention about qualifiers uh, again. I don't want to repeat this. This is uh, basically somewhat redundant with that earlier slide or what we talked about in the earlier slide. Uh, again, really uh, strongly uh, emphasize or, or encourage as much competition or as many competition opportunities as possible, whether within your own program or just inviting a nearby program. Uh, uh, if, you're, if your facility can't handle a large number of folks, just have another program who has maybe another four or five lifters that you can handle or ten lifters, whatever, uh, within your space. You can have a no frills. There doesn't have to be an audience spectator location. It doesn't have to be anything like that. Um, it can be no frills as long as it's a honest uh, powerlifting competition and you're using officials and you're using proper equipment and such and following the rules. Um, do note that you do need to have some medical uh, individual on site. Um, uh, that could be uh, typically an EMT, a nurse, a doctor. Uh, uh, athletic trainer can also fill that capacity as well, uh, depending upon their level of certification uh, uh, and, um, and such. Uh, at this point, there is one uh, qualifier that we know of that's open uh, to almost anybody who wants to go. Uh, hopefully, there may be some others that are coming online. Uh, that's at uh, Howard County, hosted by Bill Long on the 27th of September. Um, uh, and uh, we're uh, we have a, uh, a second uh, call at 8 o'clock with kayaking, um, so uh, unfortunately I need to kind of move along. But if you are planning any other event, and I had heard of a couple other counties or areas that were looking to do that, um, but uh, if you are uh, interested or planning, if you could, um, uh, after we send this stuff out, if you could let us know, and we'll include that and send that, uh, communicate that out to all the coaches and all the programs. Uh, additionally, if uh, you are interested but aren't sure what it will take, um, uh, contact uh, Nick Anderson, and we'll, we'll put that as a reminder in the communication that goes out, um, and uh, see about hosting a, uh, a multi-program uh, event. Uh, as a reminder, the deadlines or the dates, uh, we talked through most of these. I mentioned about the powerlifting training uh, is on the 9th, the live training at headquarters, and again, we're looking to, uh, Len, Len Walker is coordinating that, um, and we'll be looking to video that and see if we can't post that online. Uh, the different deadlines and such. There is a pre-competition webinar uh, on the 12th of October. Uh, that will review, that's about a week and a half or so in advance of the state competition. Uh, and that will review the specifics of the event um, uh, and such. That's not a time to first start asking about the rules. <laughs> you should be looking through the rules now. Uh, and if you uh, um, uh, aren't familiar with the rules, uh, you can get them from the Special Olympics website. Um, speaking of which, uh, we will have a guide come out uh, for this specific to the event. Uh, it says the 11th. We're hoping we can hit that deadline. Um, also want to mention about a couple different websites. Uh, you're familiar with MySOMD, or you may be familiar with that. Uh, if you've had a negative experience with that in the past, please give it another try. Uh, we made a major upgrade to that um, actually just prior to last year's competition. Uh, but we really weren't able to uh, take advantage of it uh, until actually this past summer. So we've got uh, the calendars are up to date, uh, and we're loading it up with a lot of resources. Uh, it's significantly improved. Give it another try. But the thing I definitely want to make sure that everybody is aware of is uh, Special Olympics um, Inc. or Special Olympics um, uh, International Incorporated, et cetera, uh, has invested a huge amount of time, energy, and such, and created excellent sports guides for or coaching guides for everyone or virtually every one of the sports. Um, the link is there. 
that's also the same location uh, uh, where you can get uh, locate the sports rules as well. But the guide, if you have not looked at that guide, um, when we hang up, or as soon as you get the link here, go and take a look at it. It does an exceptional job of doing uh, kind of a task analysis of each of the different skills. It goes through how you can assess your athletes. It goes through problem solving. If your athlete is doing this, uh, it gives you some ideas on correcting it. It has embedded video. I believe this one has embedded video. Virtually all of them do to show uh, technique. Uh, for those of you who know me, uh, you, you know, or many of you know that I also, as a volunteer, I coach track and I coach soccer. Um, I have my athletes go to their respective guides themselves to, because they like um, they're, they're web uh, knowledgeable, uh, but they like the video to see and improve their technique for their particular for soccer and for, for track, and the same can be true uh, for powerlifting as well. So it's just an exceptional resource. A um, uh, surprisingly large number of folks just aren't aware of it. Um, so please do make use of that. Uh, and again, you'll have the link when you get the slides uh, and uh, make use of it then. Or you can just go to the uh, Special Olympics website, uh, uh, specialympics.org. Uh, and go to the coaching guide section. Uh, we have about two or three minutes, uh, well, about four minutes maybe, for questions. If anybody has any questions on anything we've gotten over, uh, and then again, unfortunately, we need to end this session so we can go to the um, uh, get prep for the uh, one that's at eight o'clock. But any questions on anything we've gotten? And if you do, please do. Uh, you may have to unmute your phone uh, by pressing star six uh, to do so. but I just want to let you know we've been talking, Jim and myself and Donna. Uh, I think you're aware that I have opened my own facility. Yes. And, Congratulations um, on that, yes. As soon as I get back from the World Championships next week, I will be hosting coaching seminars at my gym uh, for a small fee. So if any of the powerlifters, coaches, referees would like to come, um, they can go to my I-STEP, Iron Strength Training Education and Performance Facebook page and like us. And then once we get the event set up, we will putting that information out. And I think this may be a way to network and get everybody on the same page. Um, the other thing I, I just wanted to bring up about the deadlift is uh, one thing that we need to be mindful of is if an athlete goes out to do the deadlift, they have to be able to do that lift on their own. They can't have a coach holding them or helping them with the lift. So I, I just want to put that out there. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, if you could forward that, uh, the, the link, uh, we'll see if we can include that in uh, the communications out. Mm -hmm. And I think we're also talking about hosting a couple of qualifiers as well, but uh, Jim and I, we're, we're going to talk about that further. Okay, great. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you again for spending a little bit of time uh, with us this evening. Um, we'll go ahead and stop the recording.